Aloha and welcome to the Two Wheel Revolution on thinktechhawaii.com. Uh, this is a streaming interview show where we talk about bicycles and electric bicycles and electric scooters and electric skateboards uh, and the oldest form of personal mobility, uh, walking, uh, any way we can get around our, our urban environment without a car. And uh, I hope you will stick around for the whole 30 minute show, mainly because I think it's gonna be very interesting, but uh, also because at the end, we're gonna continue our little bicycle bits or micro mobility moment. I haven't figured out what to call this thing yet. At any rate, our guest today, we're very fortunate to have Julia Thane uh, of the Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, where she is a principal for urban transformation. Before joining the Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, which is a global climate action nonprofit that's very well known and esteemed, uh, she was executive officer of, uh, for economic development for the mayor of the city of Los Angeles, uh, overseeing $150 million of financial assistance to businesses during the COVID pandemic, uh, driving sustainability policy at the Port of Los Angeles, which for those of us here in Hawaii is a very important place since so much of our uh, goods and, and materials come through there and leading mobility innovation programs across LA's transportation departments, which again, must have been a challenge because in the city of the car. Uh, but I saw Julia in action when uh, she emceed the recent Micro Mobility America conference uh, near San Francisco. Uh, and she introduced virtually every speaker and interviewed some of them and she moderated panels and she gave uh, to me one of the most uh, important and impactful talks there. Uh, so I'm really very, very happy to have her here. Julia, welcome and thanks for being, being with us. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And I only wish it was in person rather than virtual. Well, anytime you're ready, you know, we do have one or two uh, accommodations for tourists here. <laughs> and uh, you would be you we'd we'd welcome you and we would uh, we you'd probably never see the beach because we'd want you to be talking to the bicycling league and the beaky folks out there which is our bike share program and a lot of other uh, people in micro mobility so we would uh, you know we, we, you could write the trip off anyway I'd, I'd be more than happy to do that <laughs> all right we'll work on that but start out by telling us you know urban transformation principle for rocky mountain institute what is that what does that mean in uh, what does that yeah, mean in everyday talk yeah, absolutely. Uh, so again, very much uh, appreciate you having me. And it's wonderful to be able to talk about micromobility across the US and across all kinds of different contexts. Uh, when I say urban transformation and talk about the work that we're doing at RMI, as you mentioned, the Global Climate Action Nonprofit, uh, what we really mean is that we're working with cities on accelerating what we call equitable climate action. Uh, and then in my space, through uh, climate aligned urbanism. We think that land use, housing, and transportation are very much underfunded, under-resourced, and underappreciated ways of contributing to equitable climate action. And so we want to be able to pass policies, scale up technologies, think through different financing mechanisms, and honestly work with community-based organizations on uh, being able to uh, take action, whether it comes to changing zoning so we can have more compact development, building housing because we need it, and finally, making sure that we connect uh, the housing that we have to transportation options so that we can move away from the car monoculture that we really have in the US and in most states and in most places in the US. Um, so much of my work is about doing some research, trying to push through uh, new and innovative ideas, but in a way that's co-creative with communities. Well, have you, I, I uh, redouble my invitation. We've got a lot of work here for you, uh, if you if you can get you to show up. Um, but uh, I went to this micro mobility conference in, in Richmond, actually, across the bay from San Francisco. It was my first one, and uh, I was very impressed. I, I'm sure it wasn't your first one, and I'm sure you've probably in the month or so since then, you've been to three or four others. But I, I'd love to know what your kind of takeaways or impressions. You actually had to listen to pretty much everything that was said there. What are your impressions or takeaways from that conference or from other things that you are in touch with in your work? Yeah, it's a great question. And for those of you who are watching this but haven't been to the Micromobility Conference, um, uh, just to kind of set the scene for you, it's one of those conferences that's half talking and half vehicle demonstrations and uh, being able to ride the vehicles. 
So what I find really fun about it is it's this small set of people, around 1,500 people, um, who all really love, care about the vehicles themselves, plus have a deeper appreciation for what it's doing for climate, for what it's doing for affordability, for what it's doing for access, and for that matter, for what it's doing for changing the form factor of electric vehicles to be much more inclusive in my mind um, for the different types of users that there could be. So in terms of key takeaways from the event, I mean, <laughs> uh, it's funny, I get I teased a lot because I, um, as Oliver Bruce, who's one of the co-founders of Micromobility Industries, the company that puts on this conference says, I fell from urbanism back into micromobility and most people fall from micromobility back into urbanism. Uh, but that, that key takeaway for me is that Micromobility is the love child of urbanism and electric vehicles. So it's putting together this compact development, this idea of street safety, street liveliness, of having housing and services and retail all be close together with this new uh, mode of transportation that really gets you around faster, more efficiently, um, in a way that you can carry not just yourself, but other people and also goods. Um, uh, that's really important. So that's takeaway number one. I would say two more takeaways. Um, uh, what impresses me about um, that conference is just the number of vehicles, the types of vehicles you have. I went into three wheelers, I went into two wheelers, I went into things that looked like mini cars, I went into things that looked like uh, mopeds. Um, and I think that micromobility has done a really good job of leaning into user-centered design rather than I mean, I'm biased, but I look at cars and they kind of all look the same to me. Like I know there's little differences between them, but but not maybe major differences. Right. Uh, so that user-centered design feels really personal. And then finally, I'll just say, Peter, to wrap Wait, it up. I want to interrupt you for one second. Oh, yeah. so you Go you didn't it. ride the uh, electric inline skates. I'm I'm guessing because you didn't. That that was a shock to me to see some to see uh, people tooling around on inline electric skates. But let's let's. Uh, yeah, no, I thought that was funny too, and you could tell everybody was like a little bit wobbly. They were trying to figure out what do I do here. They had yeah, to hold right. somebody's hand in order to yeah. feel comfortable. I'm wobbly enough on my uh, on my scooter, and so I'm, I'm not going there. But anyway, I'm sorry. But uh, <laughs> yeah. third takeaway. Third takeaway. Yeah, no, no. Third takeaway um, is that you know, kind of like what's next with micro mobility. It's it's a tech space, so. You you always have to be looking at like what's the next level set of investments or tech that you're going to see and i think it's two things one is security um being able to protect against theft or for that matter being able to find your a micro mobility device if it is stolen mm -hmm. and second is accessories you know you've got to have um a micro mobility device that's kitted out not just you know like i talked about user-centered design but part of that is being able to have the light that works the you know, um, cart on the back of your bike that fits your groceries, um, a horn that actually sounds like a car horn so that people take you seriously on the road. Mm -hmm. And so security accessories, I think, have to be next in terms of the investments that tech companies make. That's interesting. I, I would, you know, mostly uh, when you talk to people and what I, I heard quite a bit of, of course, was safety. Uh, in addition, you know, security is kind of is maybe a subset of safety, but uh, the, the big issue for most people when you even talk about a bicycle or an e-bike is, is the safety uh, factor. And uh, I, so, first of all, let me say uh, I had uh, some takeaways and I put them in a blog that's on the, the, the two wheel revolution .com, which uh, any of my two listeners here can can look up. But um, so one of the things it seems to me is that there's uh, not just potential, but there's actual conflict increasingly uh, in this area. And most of these will have to be resolved uh, at the municipal level. Uh, of course, we've always had conflict between pedestrians and vehicles. And unfortunately, the pedestrians usually uh, lose those confrontations. Uh, but now with a, a variety of different speeds capable of, uh, you know, electric skateboards, there was one there I, that claimed to go 60 miles per hour, which made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Uh, so there's there's different speeds of, of vehicles in the space. And even, you know, within the biking community, I think a lot of the traditional cyclists, the purists, what I call the, the spandex and clip shoe crowd, uh, they look down on electric vehicles and don't let us, don't, don't come into my, my bike lanes and so forth. So do you, do you see that as conflict and, and uh, what do we do about it? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> this is where we're starting to fight against ourselves, right? You know, oh, <laughs> it's when yeah. we start to divide uh, the bike enthusiasts from the pedestrian enthusiasts from the um, 
advocates from the micromobility folks. And uh, I think it's probably unhelpful. So let's talk about this in a couple of different ways. Um, first is to go back to your point about safety. I mean, when I think about safety in a micromobility device, um, of course, there's the feeling of safety, the perception of safety as you're actually on the device. And is this going to be able to keep me upright? And am I going to tip over? Am I going to hit something? But then there's also the safety around you, the things you can't control, the fact that you are on a street, there's not usually a bike lane, and you're in mixed traffic with, uh, again, in the US, increasingly large and heavy vehicles, including electric vehicles. And so um, I think um, my first takeaway is that when we're talking about safety, those folks that I just mentioned who should be part of the same coalition, but sometimes tend to fight with each other if we're talking about e-bikes or if we're talking about e-trikes, should really band together on a few things. Um, one is that uh, just street design. I mean, we, we don't have bike lanes. We don't have enough bike lanes in the US. And I think actually what could be really cool is for the industry to come up with some new street design guidelines. I mean, we don't have to have just the regular car lanes and the bike lanes and the parking that we've had for so long. Um, because we're gonna have mobility devices that are moving at different speeds, maybe we should rethink how we, redo, uh, how we do street design um, in a way that provides for you know, either different lanes or um, uh, uh, no lanes for that matter, <laughs> just so people have um, some clear clarity around uh, where they can travel and also who is uh, in the hierarchy, um, their needs need to be prioritized from a safety perspective. Um, the second thing that I think, you know, the cities are in charge of street design and, and safety. Um, uh, but the second thing that I think some city, cities are starting to think about is speed limits and speed guards. So um, there's a number of cities across the US and even more so in Europe and other places who are dropping down the speed limit of their streets, uh, normally from, you know, like 35 miles per hour or higher to 25 miles per hour. Um, and even doing that actually starts to resolve some of the difference uh, and, and issues you might have with street design itself. Um, and then speed guards are just like new technologies um, uh, that allow for uh, vehicles, um, uh, well, they're not even that new of a technology, but allow for vehicles speed to be um, arrested at a certain uh, uh, level. So, you know, you can't actually go above 35 miles or 25 miles in a certain zone. Um, and then finally, I think about, you know, things like um, uh, automated ticketing, um, you know, uh, again, municipalities, a lot of the ways that our departments of transportation get money is because they ticket, they ticket for you um, parking for too long, they ticket for you going too fast or whatever else. Um, and even though there are definitely some issues around uh, equity and inequity of ticketing, um, there are also some opportunities for automated ticketing to be used as a way to remove human bias um, from how we do ticketing and also to remove like cargo vans from being in the bike lanes, which then makes it unsafe to bike. Mm -hmm. uh, so lots of opportunities. And I think to the extent to which the coalition of folks who believe in pedestrianism, um, cycling, e-bikes, et cetera, can get behind these three things, um, that could be really, really meaningful to improving the safety and experience of being on micromobility in cities. It is kind of interesting that uh, there are speed uh, controls on uh, on scooters very often, and uh, every, you know I even said as I as I said I was worried about a, a scooter that goes sixty miles per hour, uh, whereas the automobile you know thousands and thousands of pounds of steel uh, moving down the street there are virtually except for what the driver is willing to to impose there are no automatic or or electronic controls over uh, the speed of, of these very large, very uh, dangerous devices. So it's yeah. part of, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of inequity, the disconnect between uh, the two kinds of mobility, I think. So one other question, uh, there was a lot, there is starting to be discussion at micromobility, and I want to dive into the equity issue much more, but I want one more question. Um, and, and that is, you know, there's already some talk about mini mobility, which is uh, more like enclosed vehicles, small, two, three wheels, four wheels. Uh, and, you know, most people in America today don't know what micromobility is, much less mini mobility. And, and so I wonder if you think, are we getting ahead of ourselves here? Or, uh, you know, should, should we not get all together and get some advances in the micromobility or personal mobility space? 
uh, rather than you know having this incredible variety of vehicles and different mm. factors. Yeah, yeah, this would be a fun one to have a debate on uh, and, <laughs> and, and have a right, right. maybe it's the next panel. Yeah, for one of the micro mobility conferences. I'll be there. My, yeah, <laughs> maybe you'll be part of it. Um, my perspective on this is we should continue with this Cambrian explosion of vehicles. We're going to have some consolidation in the industry. I think we're a couple years out from the consolidation of the industry, both in terms of form factor and, and, and number of companies. But for right now, what you're seeing, and I think what tech is capitalizing on, what people are responding to with purchases, is the fact that they've been, um, they haven't had choice. You know, it's just basically been like car or nothing in terms of public, uh, private ownership rather. Right, you know, right. of course we have public transit and everything else. So there are other options, but in terms of private ownership, it's really just been like car or bust. Right. Um, so I think we need micro mobility. I think we need mini mobility. And I think we need the policies and the support um, for them to be safe and permissible on, um, on streets. Um, but um, I, uh, you know, also think uh, as part of this too, um, micro mobility and mini mobility, you know, again, need to join hands with each other uh, in terms of, of working as a coalition in terms of how they present to the consumer too. So the consumer doesn't get confused by all of these options. Right. Um, and for that matter, start to think a little bit more about how do you plug into the fact that we have quite a powerful auto industry in the US uh, and also, um, uh, that uh, sort of advantage of the auto industry in terms of having a, a bunch of the infrastructure, in terms of having uh, most of the vehicles on the road, uh, and in terms of uh, capturing people's imagination too, in terms of what mobility and transportation could and should be in the U.S. Okay, uh, as I said, one of the to me one of the most important talks there was your not very long talk, uh, on, I guess on the second day. Uh, talking about uh, equity and inclusion in, in micro mobility. So, could we go a little further into that? And, and you know, I'm not going to ask you to re redo the presentation you did, there, <laughs> but, uh, but which is unfortunate because I think many people would have, would profit from that. But can you kind of summarize the challenges you see on this uh, front, and and what you know, what are the solutions to? Uh, the inequality in transportation that you you think are are going to help. Yeah, and uh, the question is almost where to begin. I mean, it was a ten minute conversation that Peter. Hopefully, I can send you the link to, and you can put up on the website or show. Oh, notes okay, I'd be glad to, to do that. Yeah, yeah, to, for folks to listen if if they care um, or if they'd like to. But um, uh, you know, in terms of micro mobility and equity. Um, you have to start at price point. Um, so um, micro mobility devices are much, much cheaper than uh, a car. You know, the electric vehicle goes for about $40,000, a micro mobility device anywhere from $1,500 to $3,500. And then it just depends on what you're purchasing. Um, but my right. sort of challenge to the industry was, if you want to have a product that's going to be um, broadly available, you know, don't, necessarily like go out into the market thinking you're going to lose money from the beginning, but try to work with city governments, with state governments, with federal governments, with uh, philanthropies, even with financiers to bring down that price point so it can be accessible to more people. Um, I think what we miss a lot in the conversation in the U.S. is that the folks who are biking and walking around and taking transit um, are people who are on the lower income side of the spectrum. And so um, when we um, are thinking about micromobility, it shouldn't be considered necessarily only as a luxury good or only as something cool that you have that you bring out every once in a while, but something that people fundamentally rely on um, for their livelihoods and to be able to get around and to have that um, personal mobility, personal freedom that they otherwise wouldn't because they couldn't access you know, a car. Um, and that's the second component, which is um, Right now, you know, um, who has access and where there is access of micromobility really varies. Um, and it also varies a bit by the business model. So whether it's privately owned or publicly owned. Um, but in order to really drive more equity uh, in the micromobility space, um, we uh, need to have a couple of things. I mean, uh, just many more micromobility sharing programs that, again, are price point accessible to people and also are balanced geographically in places yeah, where people um, uh, who really need them can access them. So I think access is a huge, huge piece of equity or for that matter, inequity. 
Um, and then the final two things <laughs> are around the design of the vehicle itself. Um, so making sure that as my mini mobility, micro mobility form factors are being developed, um, they're being developed with many different users in mind, um, whether it's the mom who supports her kids, but also her mother, and then also, you know, has to um, go to night school and uh, go to her job during the day versus, you know, somebody who's um, uh, young in their career and uh, just commuting. And that's what they're using for, using it for. Um, I think uh, the, the space can be much more inclusive in that, in that way. Um, and then finally, and I realize this is quite a long answer, so I may be just recapping my well, no, no, no. Well, presentation. I, that's what I wanted. That's what I wanted you to talk about. So yeah, it's, on, yeah. it's on me. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just the final point is, oh my goodness, the car, the internal combustion car, engine car, has been really traumatic <laughs> for parts of um, American. Um, cities uh, in the way that, you know, highways have cut through neighborhoods and the way that it's taken up so much space that could otherwise be used for other things. Um, and my end also just in like things like particulate matter um, and emissions that have been derived from internal combustion engine vehicles. So the clearest area where micromobility can really start to contribute to equity is in terms of being able to repurpose and minimize some of the car-based infrastructure. And second, draw down on that environmental impact, which we all know is uh, disproportionately borne by disadvantaged communities. So that's the that was the crux actually of the talk was really about the climate act impacts and the equitable climate action impacts. Um, but all of those other pieces are part and parcel of this conversation around how can micromobility drive uh, equitable and environmental benefits. Thank you. Uh, you know, we, are, we have a new uh, e-bike e rebate program that's going into effect here. Uh, it's in the process of, of being stood up. And one of the, you know, there's some restrictions on who can, who can qualify for it. One of them is if you're a student, you can qualify. And the other is if you're on any kind of, of, uh, of uh, income assistance program, that allows you to qualify for this $750 rebate, which is something but not you know it's not a fortune in the, in this in, even in the the relatively less expensive environment but let me play the devil's advocate here for a moment uh i can go into costco right now or go online and buy a small e-bike for under four hundred dollars uh you know less than the cost of a phone less than what 80 visits to starbucks or however we quantify these important things and, and so you know uh don't bother me about equity. I mean, if anybody wants to buy it, wants to have an e-bike, uh, and they're, you know, a little more expensive, but still relatively inexpensive Chinese models. So doesn't that amount to equity? Anybody anywhere can pretty much, uh, you know, scrape together the 400 bucks. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> you also have to think about what the bike costs over its full life cycle. I mean, we didn't even talk about insurance. We didn't talk about right, right. Um, the operational costs of uh, cycling. You know, fortunately, with something like an e-bike, you can just plug it into an outlet. So from an energy perspective, it actually doesn't cost that much. Right. Um, but there are other costs that aren't in that, you know, major sticker price of, of what the e-bike is. Um, and then I think, you know, kind of above this question of um, uh, it just costs $400. It's like, you know, what's the trade-off and where can you purchase these things? Because um, uh, some of them are available online. A lot of people uh, are purchasing either secondhand bikes or getting bikes from friends or they're getting bikes from local bike shops. And so uh, in order, I think, to have um, that $400 really make sense for a person, you also have to be able to access the e-bike itself and, and to get it. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, $400, um, I think it still, uh, uh, sounds like a lot depending on who you are. Right. And very frankly, what you get for $400 is, uh, you know, most of us would not be get on one of those things for love or money. So, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's an interesting challenge to really see how the equity works in that case. Yeah, but, uh, and, and Peter, that's a that's a great point, which is if you pay $400 now and in a year from now it breaks and you can't use it, then you're paying another $400. You know, what what does that really mean? Yeah, right. I also think equity can't be viewed as just like you're able to own something crappy. 
it has to be, <laughs> you know, yeah, you're able right, to own right. something of value. That's what equity is versus equal. Um, and so I think that's the point where you should really be making, which is like, let's not give, you know, the crappy products to people who can only um, purchase crappy products. Let's really think about up leveling all the products um, so that people can again access them. Yeah. At different price I points. take a lot of stuff to Goodwill, and sometimes I look at this stuff and I say, you know, no poor person should be asked to use this again after after you know I finished with it. I mean, you know, there's a a level of dignity and respect that has to be included in in you know not just dollar signs when you when we're talking about equity. We have to you know treat people as human beings. Uh, that, that's great. So let me ask you one uh, final question, and, and this is, uh, I steal this from Ira Flato on Science Friday at NPR. Um, it's the blank check question. He asked scientists uh, or researchers, if you could have a blank check to do something really important in your field, what would it be? And I guess it's a little bit weird to ask a person who administered $150 million worth of, uh, of money, what would you do with a blank check? But on behalf of cities everywhere, you know, if, if money were no object, what, what do we need to do? Mm. <laughs> do I have to choose this one thing? <laughs> no, no, you know, you've got, okay. the check is blank, you know, that's, yeah, the yeah. Beauty, that's the beauty of it. You can oh, choose wow. three okay. things. I'll make three checks, you know, <laughs> yeah. Art, you're actually getting the money. I'm not worried. So uh, tell me the three things. What are they? Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, so for starters, I'd subsidize micromobility devices for everybody. Um, I actually did this calculation right before coming on this um this uh, um, uh, virtual interview um, to figure out how much this would cost. But if you gave people a $3,500 instant rebate for a micromobility device, and you considered that about 80% of the 330 million people who live in the US live in cities, which is a high number, and then thought about maybe a three quarters of them would actually want or be able to use a micromobility device, uh, that blank check, or now this written check, would be around $700 billion, which is roughly, it's actually less than what we spent on the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. That floored me. I thought it was going to be a much larger number. I thought it was going to be, you know, in the trillions. I thought uh, this will not be, you know, something that I should say in public. But actually, at $700 billion, it's something that we should consider. <laughs> uh, and I don't mean that, you know, after we've had this conversation about equity in a $400 bike, um, to be totally tongue in cheek. But I think in terms of, you know, quantifying all the benefits to people's mobility and, and health and um, just general well-being, emotional and otherwise, yeah. um, we might be able to justify spending that amount of money. Um, but, you know, other blank checks would have to go towards uh, um, street redesign and bike lane infrastructure. Uh, and then third, and this is not something we talked about, but we got to start subsidizing some of these micromobility companies. Um, mm -hmm. And when we talk about equity too, the entrepreneurs, the financial institutions, the tech folks, the um, maintenance folks who are in micromobility should be as beautifully diverse as our country is. Um, and so I think for that to happen too, um, we need to start getting serious about providing some subsidies for um, micromobility companies to, to locate, to grow, uh, local bike shops to locate, to grow um, in the U.S. That's a great answer. And, and when you even begin to think about the subsidies for the automobile industry over the course of 150 years, uh, it, it, you know, whatever we would spend on micromobility would pale by example. So I thank you very much. You've been terrific. I wish we could go longer. I wish we could, no, I hope we can do this again in the future. Uh, with that, uh, Julia, I thank you so much. And I uh, really appreciate your time. I'm going to get your, if you'll send me the link, I'll get that up on my website and, and a little more about you uh, since I could only touch on your many accomplishments. But thank you again. And um, I hope I'll see you at, at the next conference. In Amsterdam. See you there. All right. Aloha. <laughs> All the best.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.